Welcome to another exciting session packed with a lot of interesting information. This afternoon, we are going to talk about physical strategy. As you know, in the wake of COVID, a lot of stakeholders, and especially venues, have been extremely reactive and agile in implementing rigorous sanitary protocols. They went beyond the call of duty to offer the safest conditions to their delegates. At the same time, venues keep on developing innovative, sustainable solutions to show to the world that we are dedicated to lowering carbon footprint and gas emission. Green consciousness has become our motto, and yet it is not enough. Hybrid and innovative digital solutions have become unavoidable in a COVID scenario. So let's look at the stem of the word digital, and we're going to separate it this afternoon with a panel of experts. We're going to look at the fee with the physical aspect of the venue, the hardware, and we're going to look at the digital with the creative digital solutions with some of our other panelists. And also, as usual, we will have an end client, an association that will give us their input, their insight, and the way they see their collaboration and their uh, forward thinking in a digital world. So, First, let me introduce you to our panel of experts. And I will start with our association expert, Clara Fernandez-Lopez, who is the external relations manager of UIA, the Union of International Associations. Clara joined UIA in 2011. And before that, she was a publisher, a managing director, and a member of the management board of international publishing and media companies such as KJ Sauer and the Gruter in Germany, Gale in the United States, Thompson Learning in the United Kingdom. Clara has also been a publisher of UIA's Yearbook of International Organization from 1988 to 2001, to, excuse me, 2011. Since 1988, Clara is a lecturer in media sciences at the Ludwig Maximilians Universitat in Munich, and since 2017, a member of the executive board of the International Youth Library Foundation. I'll move on to Marta Gomez. Marta is the deputy commercial director at V Paris. Marta has been working for nearly 20 years in the meeting industry with professors, association executives, and destination partners to attract international congresses to Paris, ranked again number one city in the world for association meeting in 2019. On top of overseeing sales and business development for Paris, which hosts nearly a thousand events per year in and around Paris, Marta represents the European region of the ICA board, where she currently serves as the first vice president after having led the France Benelux chapter for several years beforehand. Marta is a true European citizen. She grew up in Portugal, studied in the UK, lives in France, and is the proud mother of three magnificent children. <laughs> then we have Roxanne. Roxanne Nominé, who is the site manager at Herbus Mihalou. With over 30 years of experience in the meeting industry, Roxanne is now managing the Airbus event centers in Toulouse, one of five venues operated by Mihalou. Mihalou is a major operator in southwestern France, which not only manages the Airbus Event Center, but also the Narbonne Exhibition Center and three other special venues in this region. In addition, Mihalou offers project management assistance and consultancy services to the meeting industry stakeholders in France. As a former executive of the Toulouse Convention Bureau, Roxanne is used to working with stakeholders of the French, Spanish, and British markets. She, her own mission statement is delivering the best services to our customers, sharing my knowledge, and learning from my peers. And last but not least, joining us virtually from Montreux, Switzerland, Rémi Crégu, the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Experience Officer of the Montreux Music and Convention Convention Center 2M2C. Remy defines himself as being passionate about people, travel, tourism, hospitality, events, and entertainment. 
He has been involved in the industry for the past 35 years in France, Morocco, Monaco, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. He has worked for renowned international resorts and hotel chains, Accor, Intercontinental Group, Hyatt, and Center Parks, the largest former DMC in France, also LSO International. Since 2005, Remy has been uh, the managing director of the Montreux Music and Convention Center in Switzerland, renowned host of corporate and association events, cultural events, and entertainment shows. Last but not least, Remy has always been involved in numerous professional mice associations, from MPI to PCMA, AIPC, ECM, ANAE, Coesio, and of course, ICA. So, welcome all of you. Uh, Marta, would you please tell us first what you think about the fee aspect of the digital STEM? Thank you, Eric. Um, in the last period, uh, during the lockdown period, we've been thinking about how the pandemic uh, affects people's behavior and, uh, and, and trying to think about how it will affect also the visitors and delegates who attend events. And we thought about you know, four different drivers. First of all, that people want to feel safe. Secondly, that some people will stay at home. Thirdly, people who come are going to expect more. And fourthly, that people still care. Now, I know that uh, for us venues, uh, for the last seven months or eight months, a lot of events have been cancelled, have moved to virtual, uh, have been postponed, and uh, we haven't been hosting a lot of events. Uh, at Vipari, we, start, we reopened our venues uh, beginning of September. We hosted about 40 events during the period. All of them were hybrid. And I think that uh, we can safely say that hybrid is here to stay and this is going to be the future of uh, events. And, but the thing is, thinking about you know, how we as venues get people to co feel comfortable and start wanting to come back to face-to-face -to -face events. And these four pillars are important to think about. You know, first of all, safety had to be our first priority as venues, and I think that there's been enormous collaboration, uh, at least for us on a national level and even on an inter international level, where we've seen a lot of collaboration and uh, exchange happening between venues uh, with um, documents like the safe reopening of venues that was pre prepared by UFI and IEPC, AIPC and ICA as a collaborative effort to make sure that we, there is a standardization of what is expected in terms of safety uh, across the board. And I think thinking about the future, you know, we need to look further than that even and start thinking of solutions like qu quick testing uh, to make people feel comfortable attending events again uh, and seeing you know, how we can improve even further on the safety and this feeling of safety that uh, we provide when people come and attend events. The fact that you know people, that, oh, sorry, I was <laughs> people. Uh, some people are not going to be able to come, and that they're going to be watching online. You know how we as venues can be help provide solutions for these kind of things. Uh, by a lot of venues have set up uh, virtual studios that they that help. Uh, so some some um, technological solutions. Again, looking further into that is how we can provide uh, solutions with local companies, with startups, even uh, identifying local MCs that can help you know, provide this kind of television experience. The fact of, you know, helping people to have a better experience on site. We heard this, uh, I think, this morning about not just having more coffee, but better coffee. Um, I think that it's our responsibility as venues as well to improve the delegate experience on site. And I can give you an example of, um, we recently opened a new pavilion, uh, actually at the end of last year, Pavilion 6 which not only provides, has this spectacular entrance with uh, LED streamers that was uh, designed by Jean Nouvel, but has uh, on the roof the world's largest urban roof rooftop farm that provides uh, food and uh, grows, where we grow 1,000 fruits and vegetables per day that are reused uh, in restaurants uh, on the, at the venue and where we opened the coolest bar in Paris for the summer period this year. Uh, where people could enjoy cocktails with a purpose a little bit. Um, and then, uh, lastly but not least, you know, the fact that uh, sustainability is an important issue, uh, and more, more so now with the, with the pandemic. And we, we all see, you know, I, and I think we've seen us in Paris, how much it's affected people's behavior, that people are now going to work by bicycle. It's really changed uh, the, the, the landscape of the city. And we expect to see that also affecting events and that people will think also about how to um, 
have more meaningful events that uh, involve the local community and then we give something back to the local community. So these are some of the trends that I see uh, coming forward in, uh, in our industry for hybrid events. Well, thank you. Thank you, Martha. You guys have been very innovative and I surely love the, the part about the roof with that garden experience. And I'm sure that when face-to-face -face meetings are going to roll back, a lot of delegates will be interested in trying your organic vegetables in downtown Paris. That's very, very nice. Uh, Remy, I'm turning the floor to you. What have you been doing since COVID? Tell us, please. Remy? Ah, here we go. We're having a sound issue here. We can't hear you, Remy. So I'll no, turn first to, can, go ahead. Yes, sorry. Okay. So um, since the beginning, unfortunately, we we have been doing not, not too much. Uh, in between the two uh, waves, we were able to host an event. Um, but uh, considering uh, our location, um, I cannot say we are very, uh, we don't use, our clients don't use very much uh, virtual events so far. So, please go ahead. No, what, in, what I was, uh, I wanted to say is about virtual event. I'm, I'm not, uh, I think that your events is playing a role right now due to the circumstances. But I don't, I don't believe that event will be uh, part of the future as much as uh, some people are predicting. Uh, in my opinion, uh, hybrid event will be an added value, but it will never substitute face. And uh, as a venue, we have to defend a uh, position uh, about the, we exist because we have we have been built to host people, and, uh, to host and please participate for face-to-face -face meeting and not virtual events. Okay. Uh, well, if please go ahead. And uh, we have an economic point of view, which is important. If tomorrow morning we reduce the number of, uh, of live events uh, with hybrid events, smaller events, or virtual events, uh, the economic uh, situation of uh, venues will be problematic. Agreed, agreed. Uh, I think that all of us on that panel agree that we want to go back to face-to-face -to -face meetings because this is who we are beyond the economical factor. I mean, it's human nature and our industry loves to meet, to, to, to network, to meet our friends, new destinations, having fun together and working at the same time, of course. And uh, we're all looking forward to that. But at the same time, there is a new paradigm that we cannot ignore. And the same way we had 9-11 back in 2001, now we were hit hard by what I would call a sanitary 9-11. And I think it's fair to assume that the mice industry has changed forever due to that pandemic. And especially since we do not know yet when it is going to end. And clients like financial markets hate one word, uncertainty. Okay? And of course, life has to go on. Business has to go on. And you're absolutely right, Remy. There are lots of financial difficulties, and probably the worst is yet to come in 2021, at least on the first semester. And for that, we have to be creative. And a lot of actors have been already quite creative in the industry. So I will now turn the floor to the digital part of the session, starting with Roxanne. I know that Airbus and Mihalu have been quite creative in offering digital solutions, so please, Tell us more about it. Thank you, Eric. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ika for giving us the opportunity to share our insights. I'm here with uh, you in the name and on behalf of Jean-François Renac, the CEO of Miarou. Well, to answer your question, Eric, uh, as an introduction, I would like to, to make um, a, a view uh, on the destination because it's very specific b before talking about our venues. In Toulouse, our venues were, were impacted by uh, both, in fact, by the collapse of the events in the stream because all events were cancelled or postponed from day to day and then weeks to weeks, etc. And secondly, because of the collapse of the uh, air traffic, which is impacted uh, the aer aeronautical industry. So just to give you a few figures, I don't want to, uh, to, to bother, but uh, I need to, to explain that with a few figures. We have 800 suppliers uh, in this region working in the aer aeronautical industry with direct and indirect jobs representing about 200,000 uh, jobs, which is uh, really enormous, amazing. And probably 20, 30, 40% of them will disappear in the next few months and a few years. But Toulouse is also, because we have uh, also <laughs> Uh, optimistic views uh, on the destination. Toulouse is also a science city with more than 22,000 researchers and with one, uh, 130,000 uh, students, um, which is a strong community of researchers and students working on different uh, activities and um, in the fields of space, oncology, agricultural and food industry, robotics, artificial intelligence, and IoT. So it's important to mention that um, we work, of course, because uh, of the um, aeronautical industry, but also there are a lot of uh, different activities, industrial and TV activities in our region. And we, of course, hope that uh, this, this industry will soon recover, especially by developing hybrid aircraft. We are talking about hybrid today. Um, Airbus is working on three different projects to deliver um, zero emission aircrafts by 2035, more or less, uh, with hydrogen. And um, we had a very good session this morning uh, regarding sustainability. And uh, this is also a, a matter in this industry. So I think it's important to also to mention it. And... Um, okay. uh, <laughs> Which is, by the way, an interesting parenthesis on top of being COVID responsible because all the venues in this industry have become some of the safest places to be around because of all the sanitary protocols that have been put in place since March and have been standardized in the industry. But also in terms of sustainability, like Marta and Roxanne were telling us, and we know that Remy is doing the same in lovely Switzerland, uh, our industry is really sustainable conscious and anything from venues to airplanes, I mean, we're definitely on that bandwagon and maybe we don't get enough credit for that compared to other industries. That's just a parenthesis, but I think it's, it's needed to be said. Uh, Clara, good afternoon. Can you please give us your uh, thought on the uh, physical revolution? What is your take from an association standpoint? Uh, Clara, I'm not sure we can hear you. Maybe your mic. Okay, we'll come back to you in a minute once we can hear you. So, let's switch back in the meantime to another topic, which is, is the physical strategy a craze, a band-aid? Is it here to stay? How do you see it, Marta? Is it a lasting trend? back from what we've done what's been going on in 2020 and I think that uh, as I said you know not everybody is able to travel and we've seen that um, the fact that having virtual meetings has bring has brought a lot of inclusiveness uh, and given the opportunity for people who are 
uh, can't necessarily afford to travel or in, in places where it's difficult to, to get away, to be able to really attend events and speak at events. Um, I, I think that this has often been a topic uh, for international associations and how they can involve some regions where it's sometimes difficult for people to get visas to be able to travel and they can't necessarily afford uh, to be able to stay in a five-star hotel for five nights or whatever it is that is required for an event. So I don't think that the, the digital aspect of the meeting is going to go away. I think that we've done such an amazing job as well in, uh, in, in improving the technology and the experience uh, for the people participating online and that this promise, you know, associations are going to have to maintain in the long term uh, for the future. But I think that, you know, if we look at uh, different studies that have been made by uh, either UFI or IPCA, uh, Kenneth also has released a study on, you know, the, the, the experience of delegates at virtual events. Um, Whereas there are lots of benefits, you know, because of the, the facility of being able to watch from home and lots of, you know, things that are really comfortable about uh, virtual events, that people really miss uh, some of the great moments of the face-to-face -face, uh, and that uh, in including, you know, things like networking, uh, new business relationships, and that, you know, people are kind of eager for face-to-face -to, -face to be able to come back in some form or another. And maybe, you know, events are not going to be so large or not going to be so long and will definitely be a mixture of virtual and face-to-face. And, and -face, but I do think that face-to-face -face will be coming back you know, as soon as, as possible and in, uh, in whatever format. And, and I think that I, what I've seen as well in, in uh, some of our customers, but mostly on a national level for the last uh, two or three months, is that uh, events have really made an effort to, to maintain a partially face-to-face uh, -face mm -hmm. component. Uh, and, and I've seen events that were supposed to have like five or 6,000 delegates ended up with 1,000 because that was the national limits on number of delegates allowed, some that went from 5,000 to 100, but that really wanted to maintain that face-to-face -face moment for, the, for, their, uh, for their delegates and, uh, and, and stakeholders and uh, community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remy, I'm going to challenge you on this one. I'm going to throw you a couple of curveballs here. Um, it's fair to say that with the sanitary situation and financial difficulties facing association, industries, PCOs, venues, and the like, a lot of companies are still going to go hybrid for quite some time. And also for legal reasons, because they don't want to face issues with their employees, associates being infected by the virus. And also people are going to be afraid to fly for some time. And we know that most probably to come back to some international travel level of a pre-COVID world, meaning 2019. It's going to take three or four years for the industry, assuming that we find an inoculated vaccine to the masses around the world over the next 15 to 18 months. Okay, So it's going to be a very gradual return to the airline industry. So that's one thing. The second thing is that a lot of people have got used to working with Zoom, Teams, which was not the case eight months ago unless you were in the IT department and the likes. And even though everybody gets fed up after some time, they also recognize the agility of those media and people have got used to it. And the third point is really a financial issues for venues, which is Marta just mentioned the fact that they managed to keep up to a limit of a thousand delegates some events. But when we know the complexity of the level of occupancy which was evolving every week based on the sanitary protocol and changing from one country to another, it's been complicated. And at the same time, because of, this, of the sanitary protocols, you pretty much need to give twice or three times as much space to a client that you used to do before. And at the same time, the revenues are down and the client may have a very limited budget. So how do you deal with that in order to keep on engaging your clients to maintain some physical presence in your venue? 
Well, that's an excellent question because uh, we we don't have a proper answer. Uh, how, how do you keep the contact with uh, with your client, and how do you work on uh, future projects? So far, uh, we can see everything has been postponed, like first semester 2020 to second semester 2020, and now from second semester to uh, let's say March, April uh, 21. Uh, so we can see there is a very strong positive willingness to uh, to start again. The problem is nobody is able to say when will we be able to travel uh, and when uh, we will be able to meet. So. I think the first shift will be to move back to uh, your national market and to be much more, to be stronger on your national uh, local market. And this is what we are doing. We we uh, are focusing on our local accounts and uh, to adapt our uh, sanitary protocol to smaller events uh, able to take place uh, locally, I would say. I mean, I say locally, Switzerland is a small country, so uh, but that's uh, that's easy. I mean, you can have a, a really national meeting quite easily using train, and uh, uh, it's easy to to travel and to meet. The question is, the, the risk right now is very much linked to uh, the hotel industry, because if people cannot travel, the hotel industry will die. And if we don't have hotels, we will not be able to host international events anymore. So that's for me a big a big question. We are we are part of an ecosystem. In this ecosystem, you have transportation, you have uh, accommodation. And if the whole system is weak, that's okay, because it's a situation where we, we are only on one choice is to, choice is to wait. But if one one piece of the ecosystem is uh, is broken or is too weak, then then we are facing a problem because hotels cannot live without transportation, transportation cannot live with, without hotels, and events need hotels and accommodation. So my big concern will be uh, how long transportation. Uh, airlines, uh, hotel chains will be able to survive and to stay alive. Because if they die, we will die. We will, we will, we will have to change completely our, our raison d'être, and, uh, and and that's a, 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 and that's true not only for for the meeting industry. It's, it's also uh, we are quite strong in the uh, festival uh, business. But we we host for festival every year and that's the same problem if if artists cannot travel uh, we don't have festival if artists cannot be accommodated in hotels we don't have festival so uh, that, that's a the core question for me is to predict i mean to predict to to hope uh, when things will be better and when we'll be uh, able to travel again. And yes, apparently, I mean, if you are optimistic, uh, we, we should start again traveling maybe in June 21, but uh, it will never be the same level as it used to be before. So we will have to wait certainly one or two years before we recover completely. So that means we will have to be innovative in the way we run our business, in the type of event of event we host, uh, maybe we will be intra-regional. Maybe Switzerland will host event with uh, near France, near Italy, and uh, Germany. Uh, I don't know, but um, this is the future, and for me, that's that's the very future. And maybe we will have also to to reconsider our business model and to be more than uh, 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 even the new. Maybe we should be something else also. Maybe we should have uh, more activities, different activities. Okay. I, when I see pa uh, Paris Expo uh, 
euh, vie Paris, euh, euh, building uh, hotels, uh, restaurant within the, the premise of, uh, of uh, Expo uh, of Paris in Port de Versailles. Then I say yes. I mean, this uh, this is a, quite a new business model, and this is part of it, I think. Okay. Um, I just saw a glimpse of Clara back on screen, so this is very exciting. If you can join us, Clara, are you here? Can we hear you? Yes. Ah, yes. fabulous! Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Sorry Thank about you. Bienvenida. Bienvenida. Okay, Clara. So please give us your take. From an end client perspective, from an association it's perspective, perspective, how do you live the physical scenario? What do you see? Is it a revolution for you, or is it something that is just you know a band aid until we go back to business as usual, for all the good reasons that we've been sharing with Marta, Remy, and Roxanne? Well, it certainly is is a is a challenge, yeah. And um, we see the um, external factors, as Remy just has um, described very well, what will happen to the travel industry, what will happen to hotels, what will happen to, to venues, uh, where can we hold our meetings in future, will delegates be able to travel flexible as they used to. Um, but. Um, as we cannot influence these external factors at the moment, we, we focus on, on the reality we have. And um, I must say, a big challenge for associations is um, skills, <coughs> new technology using uh, digital um, platforms, and as well, uh, the factor of human and financial resources. So, for example, we had planned our Asia Pacific event in September to take place in Seoul. And in May, together we decided it will not be possible, it won't happen. Would UIA had been on its own for organizing this event, we would have most certainly cancelled it or kept postponing it until there was no no choice. But we had a partner, a destination, who would have provided the venue, helped with travel arrangements. We had a convention bureau on our side, and they decided, we help you with the technology. We develop a platform for you. And they managed to develop a platform showing the virtual city and giving yeah, a wonderful feeling to the delegates. What we noticed is you need as, at least as many um, staff as for an, a physical face-to-face -face event. So we had as well a huge support from the Convention Bureau. And uh, without this, we couldn't have done it. So my, my plea for, for the future is, uh, <coughs> it, it's an interesting figure, but only uh, 18% of associations use um, uh, professional congress organizers or have been using them up to now for organizing their face-to-face -face events. And uh, around 35% of associations organize their events with the general staff they have. So this is um, the issue with the, the challenge in skills and in, in, in human resources. So I would really um, ask, and as you all have um, uh, stressed, is we are to together in this, yes? And uh, associations need the support of, uh, yeah, of convention bureaus and their partners, which now may change more into technology. We need as well uh, to get solutions bundled to um, help us in, in the future, because uh, I know from our association peers, they are being yeah, overwhelmed with offers uh, and technology solutions. But we do not have the staff in order to sort this out and see what is appropriate for us. And as well, an interesting figure is that um, close to 60% of associations' events of the annual event or the annual event 
is with less than 500 participants. So 60% of associations have events with less than 500 participants. Uh, so the, the budget uh, behind it is not, not very, very big. Um, I've been talking as well to, to destinations and it's uh, people, as you know, you change your working environment. They have been with uh, working for PCOs before. And, uh, and we agree we need, um, yeah, we need um, either PCOs or convention bureaus to, to bundle offers, to be the face of the local solutions and uh, to discuss with us what is the best for your event. Yes, because it's very difficult for associations yeah, to, 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 to explain different in order to move to a hybrid or digital uh, strategy. Yes, we know what we have, we know what we want, but uh, it's difficult to analyze solutions and then to apply these to our events. So there is a need for, for support. You raised a lot of important points and I think uh, one of the lessons of what you said is that all stakeholders will have to bind together, to bound together on an ongoing basis, which is not always yeah. the case in the past. I mean, you would have your venue, you would have maybe a DMC, um, mm -hmm. some professors, maybe a couple of political involved, and that was it. Whereas now, we need to have a bundled package of all those stakeholders working together towards a global solution, which means that from the very beginning, all those stakeholders have to sit at the same table to discuss about the challenge. And there are several challenges, obviously, but to understand what they want to do, and not so much in terms of content, but how to address their audiences and delegates' needs and start from there. And the monetary aspect becomes secondary, I would say. And at the same time, and Marta, I'm going to ask you on this one, um, I think it's very important that PCOs become more consultants and take their client by the hand to explain them how the physical play is going to be from now on. I think what we've seen, uh, it comes back to what I was saying in the beginning, you know, that how collaboration is exactly. more important than ever. And I think it's not just between uh, venues and PCOs and associations, but I think that, you know, looking forward, uh, partnerships uh, mm -hmm. and working together are going to be crucial, crucial absolutely, mm -hmm. for success. Um, and I think us, our, our role as venues as, as well is to facilitate that, to help introduce the local suppliers. And I think we have often a responsibility as venues to a whole ecosystem around uh, the venue that exists around the events that we host, you know, if we think that the kind of the magicians that behind the scenes, the people who are like here, the technicians mm -hmm. in the back of the room, uh, the, the caterers, the stand builders, or so many of these amazing professionals that make magic happen at events that create these uh, decors and uh, mm -hmm. uh, incredible experiences at events. And so I think our role is to facilitate these relationships between uh, and clients who are coming maybe for one-off events and the local community uh, of, of, of suppliers and, and professionals, but also to work with associations uh, in partnership and uh, offer the flexibility that they're going to need, you know, because we don't know what the future is going to look like. And I think that's going to be an important aspect as well, is, is, okay. is being able to work together. To bounce back on another of Clara's point about the skilled workforce, um, in this day and age of uh, accessibility troubles, I think that it's going to be of paramount importance for second and third tier cities to really put in the front of the stage their clusters and their skilled workforce. And I'm thinking of Toulouse with all the uh, industry, aeronautics industry, where you have really high-end skilled workers. So, Roxanne, please tell us, what do you do about that? with your politicians and the local stakeholders to put that on the forefront? Well, um, of course, uh, Toulouse is, um, I would say, second city, well, even if it's the fourth city of France. Um, uh, from origin, 
I would say that we have a great uh, network of uh, roads, trains, and f flights, even if it decreased, of course, uh, since a few months. And um, I think it's not, f maybe for the moment, it's difficult for a destination like, like Toulouse to welcome attendees uh, as it was before. Um, well, as venues, uh, we work, uh, of course, actively with uh, our, um, our convention bureau and all the, the ecosystem. Uh, we have, um, of course, um, um, put a focus on uh, our local customers in a um, in first, uh, as a first action, I would say. Um, but also, um, as our uh, some of our customers are global, uh, we've been delivering hybrid events uh, for a long time, even before uh, this crisis. Um, I would say that uh, geographical localization of um, the attendees and also their hectic uh, schedule um, don't allow them to be physically um, uh, present. Uh, this is why we have uh, developed different um, uh, digital events so that um, the attendees can <coughs> come directly to our venues and uh, the, the ones that cannot uh, attend physically can be part uh, via virtual uh, virtual tools, in fact. Um, Marta was saying that it's important to, um, to work with the ecosystem and all the stakeholders. That's what we're, we're doing, and particularly, of course, with the technical, uh, or technical partners. Uh, I mean, regarding video, sound system, um, uh, also lighting is important when you organize an hybrid event. So I think this, um, this part of, uh, of the, the future events is really important and um, venues are, have to work closely with their partners, with the technical providers, and uh, I would say all the, the, um, all the, the business change. Okay. Um. One last question for all of you guys, because unfortunately we don't have that much time today and it's already running out, it's a, it's a shame, but what about data protection? Because in the physical equation, data protection is a huge issue and especially considering that all the Zoom and the Teams and all the available platforms are at least 80% of those platforms today are either American or Chinese. Don't you think that there is a risk of flight of information? And what can we do about that? I'll start with you, Remy. Uh, I think it's, the, the main problem will be for cooperation. Uh, of course, when, when you have your internal meeting uh, with, via Zoom, you want to make sure uh, it's, it's uh, confidential. Uh, for an event, Except if you have, I mean, some specific events, I don't, I don't think it could be a, a strong issue. But of course, everybody is concerned about the, the use of your data and etc. But that's that's generic. It's something uh, is part of it, uh, and it will it will still continue. But my opinion is, it's uh, it's not linked to data. But what I believe is. We have been trying to opposite uh, telecommunication and, and events for the last uh, 15 to 20, 20 years. And in fact, it's, it's impossible. I mean, it's, there is no opposition, it's complementary. We have seen for the last 15 years, 20 years, when telecommunication is increasing and we are, we are in a world where we over communicate with every type of communication, but events have, have been also uh, increasing. So I don't think there is an opposition between both, both styles and they must live together. What I'm sure is it right now, since the, the COVID, we are, uh, we are in a world of abundance of uh, communication. There is too, co too much communication. Uh, we are saturated of communication. And uh, and this is a, this is a danger for me because too, too
too many events kill the events, especially if it's virtual, because virtual, you will never build a relationship and trust virtually. It's impossible. Virtually is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, as a specific use, but face-to-face -face will remain forever as the only way to build a relationship and to build trust. And this is why uh, I am convinced the future of uh, events is still uh, enormous. And, uh, and I'm sure the technology will help on the side as an added value to, uh, to, to boost and to develop uh, this fantastic industry. Thank you, Remy. Clara, what's your final take on that? Well, I agree with uh, everything uh, Remy has uh, said. Now, we have, of course, strong discussions at UIA about data protection, but um, we are not very, um, yes, we do not, yes, we we would do our, our meeting, our own table on, on a platform as Zoom or as we are doing now uh, on, on, on Teams, um, because... Uh, what can what can you do? Yes, uh, you have to use something, and uh, we all work with with search via Google and use WhatsApp, and it's uh, all on the same on the same um, uh, level of uh, of threat and of of, of risk. Uh, yeah, and um, I, I just wanted to um, one one more thought, um, because uh, of course meeting virtually or or um, hybrid digital. I think it's it's this is something which will stay because it's a global pandemic we have now. But I think the solutions to a pandemic will not be global all at once. There will be um, countries uh, more lucky to have a, a vaccination earlier, um, and groups of people and others won't. And it will take time until travel normalizes. So being able either to physically participate or participate virtually is a good and is, in my view, a democratic solution. And will allow many participants who were not able to travel even when there were no health restrictions to participate at events and to be part of the um, community. Let me ask you one final question, uh, Clara. From what you hear within your organization and your colleagues from other associations, if you were to put a percentage on the hybrid events within two or three years, what would you say? 10, 15, 20, 30 percent? Less? Uh, mm, hybrid, I would say around, I would say around 30 from what we hear. Yeah. I agree. That's We're doing a survey. We may know more after the survey. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Clara. Now I'm switching back the floor to Roxanne for final words. What, do, what is the last message you want to give us in terms of the physical strategy and revolution? Uh, well, um, I would say that, that uh, of course, uh, as, um, from a venue perspective, uh, we are linked uh, in the meetings industry. And uh, I think we can um, bring uh, alternative solutions by diversifying our services. Um, and be flexible, as Mata was saying previously. Um, for me, hybrid events will allow to maintain links between community members, and uh, we are really involved uh, with them to ensure uh, the sustainability uh, of our customer projects. And uh, live events, as uh, Rimi was saying, will be for me more valuable in the future than uh, ever before. A live gathering will be fully embraced after a long period of social distancing. And, uh, well, we are really optimistic about that. Um, Hybrid events uh, is, uh, as always, have always uh, exist, in fact, uh, and probably will stay. So we'll, we'll always have a part of digital and a part of physical. Uh, but what is important to um, keep in mind is that we, we will always have events. So, well, I would say that uh, that's my, um, my insight and my input on, um, on that. Thank you, Roxanne. <laughs> and last but not least, the final word for our first vice president. At Ika, Martha. So I think that it was uh, a very long time to be able to manage the quality digital events. I think 
as we are going into a second lockdown period, uh, that's what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks, is uh, uh, have uh, studios for, for digital events. I think it's important for us as venues to defend face-to-face -face and to advocate for the, the, the irreplaceable quality of the face-to-face -face events bring in terms of human interaction, networking, uh, and creating a sense of belonging. And when we think about um, what's been happening in terms of working from home uh, and the effect that's had on people uh, and the, the feeling of loneliness, I think events really can play uh, an important role in people bringing people back uh, into the communities and creating for, for companies, uh, again, a sense of belonging uh, that is, is really irreplaceable. And I'm, I'm, I'm an opera lover, so the last uh, opera that I went to see was in the Palais Garnier, where I went to see La Traviata, and in the meantime, been watching opera online. But I think that, you know, how can we as venues create that experience and help our customers recreate that excitement of when the orchestra begins to play and the, and the curtain goes up? And, uh, and, and our role is to provide you know, the best possible on-site experience, the, most, the safest and the most premium experience to help our customers create uh, memorable and meaningful meetings in the future. Thank you very much, Marta. So thank you to our distinguished panel experts. And as you can see, there is hope for the face-to-face. -face. Everybody wants to be back on the bandwagon. And even though the hybrid revolution is here to stay, up to a certain extent, there is no doubt in the mind of our experts that face-to-face -face will still be the solution, and this is the right thing. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing you again on other ECA panels. Bye.